So here we have the drumstick spinach, which is considered a superfood. There's the sangapu, the aparajita, Clitoria tenetia, which is very good for your brain, for women, for their uterus. This is a super juice. This is a lovely spinach called ponangani spinach. It's a traditional spinach. You know, if you ask Tamilians about ponangani, they're like, yeah, this is our culture. It's good for your skin and good for your eyes. Then we have the wild brinjal. This wild brinjal, we don't plant it. Like actually quite a few of these things we don't plant, they just grow. And this is also very good for reverse diabetes, for kidneys. This is something that's so fundamental, you know, in, the, in our very existence. To know what foods are local, to know what foods are good for us, to know what foods, you know, can be eaten. This is so good for you. This is like a magic plant. And it's a weed. I was very fortunate as a teenager because I went to J. Krishnamurti school in England. And in that school we were very free, you know, to explore more existential questions of life, you know, why, why was I born, what's the meaning of my life? Alone and dry Oh cry and bear it all Myself a call, I'm just an echo on a distant wall Oh, could it be that beauty's kiss tonight It drives me far from my tomorrows Say my prayers and I'll say them right I ended up studying a lot of jazz guitar and I was doing a lot of theatre I was even doing research in genetics My teacher, he encouraged us to get involved in publishing scientific papers but it was at that time that I discovered my passion for farming and gardening, you know, a life close to nature, growing my own food. There was a teacher in our school who had lived in Oroville in the 70s and he, he was very involved in what he was doing and it was very appealing to be with him and I I learned from him that we don't have to go to university to do master's degree. Growing your own food, living in community, living a simple life is equally valid. So when we started Solitude, you know, it used to be farmland, but it hadn't been used for many years. And it was just an empty land. It was flat and the soil was, uh, you know, a little poor. There were weeds growing and a few neem trees. And that was all that was there. So we really started from scratch with this land. We're trying to understand and replicate the natural systems in nature. There are so many natural systems going on in nature. I mean, the first obvious one is that leaves and organic matter fall to the ground and decay and become healthy, you know, available nutrients for the plants. So the first element in natural farming, what I say is the first and last technique, is to value all the biomass around us, the organic matter. This bioresource is our profit. It's not a financial profit, it's a nutritional profit. Because when we return it back to the soil, soil becomes healthy. This is the very premise of natural farming.
people in the city people outside are still stuck with like maybe like seven to eight varieties of food that they are eating people are just eating cauliflowers some maybe like in bombay also we eat like two varieties of spinaches but when i came here and i saw it was like eight varieties of spinaches and out of that four are we are not even growing You see, food these days is functional. You eat to go and do the job. Everything is geared towards economic gain. I got the iPad, I got the car. But when there's no water left in the tap, what use is that? Man has gone so far away chasing economic growth, he has to come back to this. This is the future of farming. First, as I said, we, we plant fruit trees. There's a ram fall and there's, you know, there's tamarind and there's jackfruit and mangoes and supporters. There's a, a wide diversity of fruit trees. And then there are all the papayas and bananas and so many other plants which are sort of the intermediary infrastructure. And then we have things like the ladies' fingers and there are cucumbers and pumpkins, the sort of shorter duration, the annuals. Then we have all the spinaches that are just growing everywhere. I mean, of course, some of them we'll do in a line like the amaranth, but many of them are wild. And it's these more wild plants that are really interesting. Like, I mean, take this chili here. This chili is an amazing chili. It'll grow like about four meters high. We'll get a good full bucket of chilies from it and we didn't grow it. This Sundakai is really a very special plant. Again, it's something that we haven't grown. It grows all over the farm now and it grows all over the farm because we valued it. But the main point is we didn't grow it. It grew on its own. There was no industrialization needed for this. There is no carbon footprint. Over the years, we've had less and less rainfall. In fact, over the last seven years, apart from cyclones, there's a couple of them that filled up the well, we haven't had a monsoon that really filled the well. And that makes irrigation really a challenge. But when we return organic matter back to the soil, you start to see the soil becomes like a sponge, you know, it's holding water. You know, this poricity is really synonymous with fertility and this poricity allows for us to irrigate less. People ask me, you know, what about pests in natural farming? There are no pests because there's an equilibrium starting with the soil and then starting with such diversity. As you walk through the fields, there's a very nice smell of different plants. The insects find their place in that, but not one insect predominates to create destruction, you know, of the whole crop.
this is a cafe that values local foods and it's amazing to see how it's grown over the years. In 2014 we started with the full-blown menu and that's like nearly six years ago. It's become so popular and you can see in our bioregion how green papaya is slowly valued in more, by more and more people, how certain spinaches are valued by more people. Someone from Sweden showed me how she was using the banana stem and you know that's very heartwarming because that's the aim of this cafe. I think at the moment we're doing about uh, 80 to 90 baskets in a month. So that's a good income and it's all income paid in advance, you know, either a month in advance or three months in advance. Many people come in, they say, how can I start? And I've got this one acre land. And I say, well, start with fruit trees and around each fruit tree, make a garden. You know, so you're watering those fruit trees and that water will also go for that garden. So around each fruit tree, you have like a, a two and a half meter diameter circle where you have tapioca, the maravilli kelinga, kappa, you have drumstick, you have a papaya, you have a couple of bananas, and maybe you have pumpkins that go out. So instead of trying to, you know, irrigate the whole field and take care of a whole field, you've actually got, say, 20 or 30 circles that you take care of, and you could even put a drip on each circle, because you have to be practical, you know. This is a very romantic idea that we're presenting, but it's grounded in utter pragmatism and, and reality. The key to this system for a local farmer after the technical, you know, implementation is community. Because without community, you can't share the gifts of Mother Nature. Shops don't want banana stem and banana flour and chicken spinach, you know. Shops want beetroots and potatoes and carrots. So it's really about having a community of 20, 30 people for an acre farm and they, they say, give me the nutrition of Mother Nature. Let my children grow up eating seasonal foods, eating foods that are relevant to my culture and are, are good for me nutritionally and medicinally. So when you have that community that honors the farmer and honors what he can offer, then the farmer has economic you know, gain. He'll have an income. Oh, have you seen my, have you seen my, I defy the line that's drawn to define me. Have you seen my, have you seen my, I defy the line that's drawn to define me. Have you seen my, have you seen my, I defy the line that's drawn to define me. Have you seen my, oh, have you seen my. I defy the line that's drawn to define me.